Hello and Hello and welcome to the Daily Space for today, April. I don't remember, and I have the wrong thing appearing underneath me underneath my name right now. Let me see if I can change this. 30th. It's the 30th. Let me try that again. Hello and a welcome to the Daily Space for today, April 30th, 2019. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. We have a whole variety of stories today, and I wasn't sure what, port what order to put them in, so we're just going to go in the order. I found them in my inbox. So this means we are starting off with a tale of J1124 plus 4535. This rather unassuming star that is sitting there going, hi, I'm yellowy green. This particular star was recently found hanging out in our Milky Way galaxy, but it doesn't seem like it started there. Oh, am I having the two mics problem again? Oh man, why am I getting echoes? Okay, hold on everyone while I try and figure this out. I will try again, starting over in a moment so that we can get a clear audio. This is two days in a row we've had this issue which tells me it's a setting on this computer somewhere. Okay, is anyone else having the echo issue? I see that Veronica and Paranor were both having echo. Susie's having echo, okay. Did that get rid of the echo? Still there. Really? Really? Okay, why am I getting echo? Let me let me check out Wirecast. So I see one micro oh, I have two microphones turned on. That's why. Okay, that should be fixed now. Are we doing better? Do you only have one microphone now? <laughs> oh, Larry. Um, still a little echo reverb. Let's try moving the mic closer to my face. Oh, I bet I need to transition. Okay, hopefully this got it better. All right, we're gonna go with this and I shall start this over one more time. Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, April 30th, 2019. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay and I am here to put science in your brains, now with more improved audio quality. Thank you all for being here. We have so much news and I had no clue what order to put it in. So the current order is the order I found it in my inbox. And the first story I have to bring you is a tale of J1124 plus 4535. This particular little star was recently found hanging out in the disk of our Milky Way galaxy. Now, the thing is, this star is not made of the normal combination of chemical elements you would expect to see in a star that was born in the Milky Way. Stars have a chemical composition that is determined by what they're made of, which 
Yeah, they're all made of gas. They're all mostly hydrogen and helium. But each individual pocket of star formation has its own unique mixture of other elements, its own ratio of technetium and iron and all the other heavier elements. And this particular little star had a particular ratio of elements that you just don't see when you look at open clusters, at star-forming regions like Orion, or even at older stars like our own sun. But it is the kind of chemical signature you see in stars in the dwarf seroidal galaxies that orbit our Milky Way. It is now thought that we have found a stolen star. This is a star from a dwarf galaxy that our Milky Way cannibalized, ate up, and kept the stars of. So we are seeing the echoes of past generations of star formation that took place elsewhere and were stolen and added to the bulk of the Milky Way. And this really goes to show you how our Milky Way grows over time. It does this by consuming smaller galaxies. Galaxies are cannibals. This is how they grow. And it is widely thought that the majority of galaxies started as small clusters of galaxies that merged into bigger and bigger galaxies. And the structure of the galaxies that we get all depends on how those early galaxies came together to fill, to build these bigger and bigger systems. It's just kind of cool. It's kind of fascinating when something that looks as boring as J1124 plus 4534 happens to look is in reality so amazingly interesting. Now, in other news, a few months ago, back on January 21st, 2019, we had an eclipse of the moon. And during this particular event, observers all over the appropriate hemisphere were able to see a bright flash hit the lower quarter of the eclipsed moon. And that bright flash, well, we figured out pretty quickly was probably due to an impacting space rock. Well, scientists in Spain that happened to have their telescopes focused on the moon during this event, this would be the Midas system of telescopes, they were able to go through all of their different images taken in multiple filters. So they were able to see different colors and measure the ratios of the different colors during the impact event. And um, what they were able to figure out is that little impactor was probably moving at about 61,000 kilometers per hour. It most likely created a crater 10 to 15 meters across. And they measured that its impact flash lasted for 0.28 seconds. Well, that 0.28 seconds combined with the color information they got led them to realize it was probably about 45 kilograms. So half of a person, basically. And it measured 30 to 60 centimeters across. Now, what gets me is this little tiny object that gave off this really bright flash, thanks to all of the velocity it had. The energy of impact was 1.5 tons of TNT. And this is where it's so important to remember that the energy in a collision comes from two different things. It comes from the velocity of the collision, and it comes from the mass of the collision. This means that if you have a really fast moving little tiny thing, they can actually do serious damage. Anyone who's been bike riding and gone head first into a June bug has experienced this. That little tiny June bug with all the velocity you have on the bike will leave a bruise on your forehead. Do not bike into June bugs. Well, in this case, also don't orbit into rocks. That's 61,000 kilometers an hour. That's the relative difference in velocities between the moon and the object that hit it. Velocity is the enemy in this particular case. Okay, in other news, we're moving out to the middle of our solar system and here focusing in 
on Saturn's moon Titan. Now, in general, this particular moon sits there looking really yellow. It has a super thick atmosphere. It's really hard and annoying to study because it has a super thick atmosphere. And that super thick atmosphere is also really cool and confusing because it is made largely of methane. And methane is a molecule that breaks down in sunlight. This means that the fact that it has an ongoing methane atmosphere means that methane is constantly getting renewed somehow, and we're not entirely sure how. And it could be geologic, and it could be life, and it could be both, and not knowing is what makes this so interesting. But we're not here to talk about potential life on Titan today. Instead, we are here to talk about studies of what is going on on the surface of Titan. People have looked at Titan using the Cassini space probe and a variety of different pieces of instrumentation, from spectroscopes to IR imagers to radar. Many different forms of data have been taken and combined in new ways, looking to find out, well, what there is to find out. And recently, a team of astronomers, or in this case, planetary scientists, looking at this little world we're able to discern that it has, shown in blue in this image, an icy band where that ice is methane ice that appears to spread about 40% of the way around Titan. This is not something we knew it had. We, we had previously seen uh, lakes up in the northern ex extremes of this little world that appeared to be seasonal lakes made up of a combination of methane and ethane. Well, now we're just seeing this large section of ice. More study needs to be done. We need more spacecraft out at Saturn. But for now, we have the Cassini data to keep going through, keep finding new ways to put together, and it's just kind of awesome. And in more news, because dear God, there's so much news today. Um we have a really cool new, I'm, not, I'm just going to let the video speak for itself. Oh, you're not getting any video sound. That's super strange. Okay, hold on. It's going to be a day for technical glitches, apparently. Let me fix that. I bet earlier I uh, just added the wrong audio device, and that was the cause of the earlier failures. Okay, here we go. Um, no, it just wasn't there. Ah, stop. Go back to the beginning, you silly thing. Let's go up a video, up a slide, down a slide, press play. You're still not hearing it. Why aren't you hearing it? Okay, let's try this one more time. live television. You're actually hearing the vibration of the sun. It almost has a warmth to it. It's just enough where I can almost feel the sound on my skin or on my clothes. I imagine feeling the sun, you know, moving next to me. My name is Alex Young, and I am the Associate Director for Science in the Heliophysics Science Division here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. When anything material moves, waves travel through it, and the same thing happens inside the sun. 
And these okay, waves I'm just are traveling, go back bouncing to around the inside. beginning of this so that we can hear the sun again instead of listening to Alex. So let's listen to the sun one more time and then I'll tell you what's going on. actually hearing okay so that sound that you were hearing and um i want to point out this is research that was done by jacqueline goldstein not by alex young this is jacqueline goldstein's research i what she and her team have been working on is modeling stars and how the nuclear reactions that are going on in their core set up waves that resonate through the atmospheres of stars. If we were able to survive being inside of a star, these are the noises that would vibrate through your body if we sped up time tremendously. This has been ha this has had to be spun up just because the super long wavelengths in stars just are beyond, well, what we can experience. Uh, Paranor, enjoy, and no spoilers, Paranor. Uh, yeah, I, I mailed you, Eddie Hair. Sorry about that. Um, so what we were hearing with this particular simulation was using a computer model. They figured out in a star... How do the various oscillations move? How do they reflect, refract, combine, resonate? And this was the result. And I love how the harmonics of it make it sound something like um, basically a cheap horn. It's a cheap horn. But it's a simple system. It doesn't have the complexities of a wooden oboe or a reed instrument in general. It, it doesn't have the straight through embouchure of a flute. It's just a horn. And that's kind of cool. So now you've heard something you've never heard before. And in our final story today, um, we have a story of a black hole misaligned. So in, yeah, almost like a didgeridoo, Alcorn, I agree. Uh, so in this particular story, the compact system that, that is called V404 Cygni, this is a system that was first observed back in 1989 to most likely be a black hole orbiting a more normal star, sucking matter off the black hole as is, sorry, over there, as is shown in this artist's rendition. And over time, that material that's getting sucked in towards the black hole builds an accretion disk. This disk of material periodically flares up, undergoes nuclear reactions of its own when it gets too entirely dense. And it also, because you have hot, dense material, ionized, charged material moving rapidly in a circle, it's also generating a magnetic field. And magnetic fields have the ability to jettison material in jets. When you hear black hole yada 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 has jets, it's not the black hole that has jets. Nothing gets out of black holes. It's the disk of material that is creating that jet. And in this particular case, it appears that the rotating black hole and the rotating disk of material around the black hole aren't perfectly lined up. So as material goes from trying to, to orbit in the plane of the accretion disk to instead being in the plane of the black hole, as all that angular momentum gets conserved and spun together, what ends up happening is the inner part of this disk precesses changing the direction of the jet, essentially causing this thing to, well, spray like a sprinkler, except instead of spraying water, it's spraying plasma. 
This is the first time we've observed a system like this. We are definitely going to be observing this system more. And what we're seeing is these objects that we've discovered far in the past, not the 89 is that far in the past, but these previously discovered objects, as we get better and better technology, we're able to see them behaving in really cool ways that they've probably been behaving off and on all along, but we just didn't see it before. Now, to be fair, this particular object, uh, it's thought that this, this behavior is tied in part to an outburst event that it had in the not too distant past. Um, this is a system that's called an X-ray binary. And that outburst that I mentioned occurred in 2015. So what we're seeing is the bad behavior left over from an explosion in 2015 that four years later is still causing this thing to spray like a sprinkler. And that's our universe for you. It sometimes does things far more creative than we usually come up with on our own. So as always, I look forward to seeing these things get brought into science fiction because it turns out our universe, well, it's doing things that if a science fiction writer came up with initially, they'd probably be told that's too crazy, you don't write that. And this is why it's so fun to be a scientist sometimes. Anyways, I am now rambling, and so I am going to encourage you to type in your questions. I will go ahead and answer them, and please at me. It really makes it easier for me to find your questions. While you're typing them in, I'm going to remind you that we are a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. If you miss an episode... Well, I can't answer your questions live, but you can come back and watch everything that we've recorded over on YouTube. People over on YouTube, I see you. I see your comments. I'm so grateful for your feedback. I love watching how you point out what's going on and help each other find the true beginnings of these episodes when I failed to start coherently at the beginning. Thank you. And I hope to see more of you over there. If you are watching this on YouTube, please go ahead and click that subscribe button. It really helps us get found and raises science up in the search engine algorithms. And we all need a little bit more science in our days. Now, we are, as always, brought to you by you. We are so very grateful for all of your bits, your subscriptions over here on Twitch, and your patronage on patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. Thank you all so much for all that you do. And now I am going to look for your questions and see what there is to answer. Um, and it looks like the very first question is going to take me right back to this black hole. So let's get it pulled back up on screen. So Hanny's Forverp is asking, does everything with an accretion disk, disk get jets? Do protoplanetary systems? Pretty much anything that has an accretion disk that is big enough can have jets. This means that T. Tauri stars, baby stars in the process of forming that have disks of material around them forming planets, they also can have jet jets, and we have observed these. Alara Sophia says, will the jets from the accretion disk eventually disappear? So I'm, I'm pausing because I'm trying to figure out if disappear is the right word. Um turn off might be a better way to think of it. At some point, the black hole will have stripped so much material off of its neighbor star. Thank you, Uncle Bill. Um, the, the black hole will have stripped so much material off of its neighbor star that there is no more material to strip off. At that point, cannibalism will cease. The accretion disk that is already there will slowly get nommed over time. And those jets will turn off when that accretion disk ceases to be there due to lack of what we scientifically call mass transfer between the objects. Uh, are there other questions? 
So Veronica Cure is asking, is this the first time we have seen a black hole shoot out something? No, we actually see that happening on a fairly regular case, which is, what is really new right here is being able to see the, the jet rapidly change the direction that it's pointed in. We've seen this happen over decades, but here we're seeing it over years. So Henry Zwerverp is asking, what is the percentage of eaten accretion disk to ejected around a black hole? Um, the vast majority of the material is going to get consumed rather than flung out. It's mostly just electrons that get flung out. Um, for the most part, everything that's more substantial gets consumed. Okay, I'm going to scroll up to the top and see what questions I missed at the beginning. Uh, yeah, the two mics were live. Sorry about that, folks. Um, thank you, Ed. Thank you for the bits. Oh, I have dogs who now know that sound. They know that sound so very much. Um, okay, Stella's... Ah, Stella now hears crinkling. <laughs> thank you, Tricker Kev. Is this a good idea? Do you like this? You do. These are big. Okay, so the Cheerios are out of reach, but I have dog treats. Thank you, Veronica Cure. Okay, I know. I'm going to throw her. Ah, Eddie, come here. Come here, Eddie. Come, Eddie. Okay, fine. There's a second one. <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. They both have one. I promise they both have one. That just got a little bit messy in between. And I will grab the box of Cheerios. One moment. Come on. You want to show off for everybody? Come back over here. Come back over here. Over here. Lie down, Eddie. Lie down. Stay. Stay. So as always, the best way we know to thank you is with cuteness. So thank you from my heart to yours and from you to my dog's stomachs. Thank you. We bring you cuteness. Uh, okay, so let's see. Hello, Astro B. Um, so Henny asks, is that star moving in an odd way relative to the rest of the stars in the galaxy? Um, yes, just it's not moving retrograde from what I recall of the paper, but it's it got spotted. So the star that we're being that we're talking about, of course, is the poetically named J1124 plus 4535. Uh, let's see what other questions there might be. Henny asks, where does all the nitrogen in Earth's atmosphere come from? Is that normal? I heard it was like 80% of the air. So nitrogen molecules are fairly heavy. They're really easy for the Earth to hold on to. And when those nitrogen molecules hit lighter weight things like hydrogen and helium, they send them off at escape velocities. So our atmosphere is majority nitrogen because it's easy to hold on to has oxygen molecules, also easy to hold on to. And then, of course, all the various forms of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and other gases, methane, ethane. Um, and it's just a matter of what can our planet grasp in its gravitational hands and then protect with its magnetic field. So it's hard to say what is normal just because we don't know enough other planets. But it's completely explainable. And it makes sense. Uh, okay, let's see. What else is going on in here? Uh, so Hanny is asking, do neutron stars get accretion disks? Uh, yes. And I'm not sure what an ergosphere is here. Um, neutron stars can have accretion disks. So can white dwarfs. Recurring novae, um, cataclysmic variables, all of these different flaring over and over stars and sometimes just want stars are a combination of a compact object and a fairly normal star nearby and a case of cannibalism. 
Stars eat stars, galaxies eat galaxies. It's a dog eat dog world out there, but not in here where the dogs just eat Cheerios and dog treats. Uh, and I think that got me to where I was. Um, thank you guys for the bits. Thank you so much. Okay, so Rev Matt writes, there is a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere, which is important for plants. Yes, without nitrogen, plants can't grow. So on the way to Mars, the spacecraft could have a nitrogen-oxygen mixture, not low-pressure 100% oxygen to make the greenhouse work. Well, more than that, you don't want to do 100% low-pressure oxygen because that just gives you a death atmosphere that's a bit too flammable. Um, we learned that with the Apollo spacecraft. It's generally just much healthier um, to have that higher pressure. You can also smell things better, and it makes your food taste better. Um, so hopefully we will keep that nitrogen atmosphere on the way to wherever we decide to go next. So Jay Sarah writes, I listened to you and Fraser discuss Bose-Einstein condensates and how they spread out due to the poly exclusion principle, causing some to drift away to avoid their electrons having the same quantum state. Is there a force associated with this in the sense we think of the four fundamental forces, or is it something different causing that motion? I know it's not an additional force. I'm trying to figure out how to explain it in terms of the forces we have. I think this falls into the electromagnetic force. So it's the, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the electromagnetic force at play there. Um, it's not an additional force. So Hanny is asking, so we would expect an Earth-sized planet to have a nitrogen and argon atmosphere. Um, we, we don't know what to expect universe-wide. We simply know that what we have makes sense. And other solar systems may find their own ways to do it. We are a case of one. It could be that other worlds tend to be more Venus-like with death atmospheres. It could be that magnetic fields like our Earth has are rare and atmospheres tend to get blown away more like we see on Mars. So I can't tell you what's normal. I can just tell you that what we have isn't exceptional. Uh, so Mike Cassidy writes, uh, since temperature is movement and the center of a black hole is very small, does that mean the center of a black hole is very cold? I don't talk about the centers of black holes because that starts to get into the land of philosophical questions like, do black holes even finish forming given the way time slows down? And I'm just not going to go there from here because it also starts to get into the points of reference and who are you talking about? And it makes my head hurt and I haven't had lunch yet. Um, it's complicated. Um, and I think it would depend on who you talk to and what they ate for breakfast perspective. This is always the problem with black holes. Hello, fellow hoodlum. Hello. Um, so do we have any more questions out there? And as a reminder, you can always follow us on YouTube. It really, these are the kinds of things that really help us show out a lot by helping other people find us. Uh, it makes us easier to find. It's one of those snowballing effects. By sharing us with other people, you never know when you're going to happen to share us with that one person who has a company that is like, I would like to sponsor them, which makes our whole life easier because I hate begging for money and it's too much of my job. Anything you can do to spread the word, anything you can do to help us in the search engine results. All these things really help in important ways, and they are completely free. Uh, okay, Alara Sophia asks, does the black hole do anything to the material in the jet that makes it distinguishable from other plasma we might detect? I mean, plasma floating around away from any black hole that we can say from observing it, that it has the characteristics that mean it was once in a jet like this. Well, in general, 
these systems are best thought of as a single contiguous unit um, that all have to be together in order for the different components to make sense. So you have a black hole. Material is spiraling around the black hole. That spiraling material generates a magnetic field. That magnetic field flings particles out along the jets. It's all a system. Now, as the material gets further and further away from that magnetic field center, the magnetic field decreases, the material interacts with the surrounding materials, uh, collisions occur, it gets slowed down, shock waves form. And we only see these kinds of jets in these contiguous streams. Now, sometimes the jet will have recently shut off, and so there'll be a gap between the black hole and where the jet turns on. But it's always a complete system that we find this stuff in. <laughs> Hanny, I also am avoiding Twitter other than specific users because of potential endgame spoilers. Yes, this is true. No spoilers. No, none of you spoil. Thank you. Uh, okay, now that we are completely sidetracking ourselves, I think it is time to say thank you for being here. I am now going to look for someone to raid so that we can keep the learning going. You are always welcome to make suggestions. And when you don't have suggestions, the place I always go is the Knowledge Fellowship uh, over on Discord. This is a group of people, streamers, all trying to increase the learning that goes on over here on Twitch.tv. Uh, so Demon Machine is streaming. Kit Boga is streaming. Pixel Logic Dev is streaming. That one looks interesting. Let's see if that one's still going. Um, this is the awkward part of the show where I'm trying to type things in and do too many things all at once. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, thank you. Something just made something go bing, bing, bing. I don't know what it was, but thank you. Whatever it was, I now have a dog demanding Cheerios. Yes, I will throw you Cheerios. I will. I will. Go get them. Okay. Um, it looks like Pixel Logic might have already gone offline. Yep. Um, what's Timber a new streaming about, Uncle Bill? I can also type this in and figure this out. Timber a new, oh, makers and crafting, that works. Let's go ahead and raid that. And I will, of course, as always, roll the credits. And uh, I just want to thank all of you for being here and um, say one more time, please follow us on YouTube. Okay, that is now out of my system. And um, wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. And get outside and look up. Bye-bye. <laughs>